Okay, so reading two is new. And uh, mentioning this because reading one was largely not new, but this one here, um, there are one or two things that haven't changed um, in reading two, guys. Things like uh, Grinald and Kroner, uh, things like Singer and Turho haven't changed that much. But if anything, the number of models are far less. Um, I can think of five or so other models that are no longer here. So the, the, the main change to me, it is more wordy. It definitely is more wordy, so it's important that you have a good read over. Um, but uh, very interesting, a lot more up to date, some interesting ideas that, that have come in here. Just to set the scene where, where we're headed here, um, in this part two, they are uh, specifically talking about the, the three things. We have the expected returns, we have the volatilities as well, and we have the correlations. And, and like we said, uh, all these are the inputs into our famous, very famous MVO optimization process. The mean being the return, the variance being the risk, optimizing having the, the best blend or, or mix. And, and so the, the output, because the output of this process is our famous efficient frontier. Our famous efficient frontier here where we have the expected return on the left, we have our volatility underneath here, and where this comes back to, where, what we're going to do with this uh, here is return to the start of the process to the investor's required IPS return. Well, what return do they require? What balance of risk and return do they require? And as the output, the output that you receive from this process um, are the weightings, the asset weights to create the portfolio. So the, the focus in this, the strategic asset allocation, the inputs are needed to get that, uh, that portfolio for our clients. So our focus on these inputs is where we're headed guys, in this second, second reading here. There you have it, guys. They talk about, yep, yeah, on our capital market expectations, number one, the, the returns, number two, those variances, number three, the, the correlations. And um, I guess you have a mix here of the past, you know, looking back at the past, and also you, your judgment for the future. Now, now remember the term that we used last time round. that's quite a useful uh, one that's mentioned quite a bit here is shrinkage. They call it a, a shrinkage estimator or sh shrinkage technique is a... A, a term just for saying having, having two estimates are better than one. Um, two heads are better than one, two estimates are better than one. Um, so, so you might have a, a, a weighting for the past data and then one minus that weighting for your own judgment. The idea of having this shrinkage technique is coming in as well, as well too. So we have um, uh, three methods. Let's have a look at them in a bit more detail here. Surveys, judgments and some of these tools. When we do a survey, perhaps you have uh, thinking about interest rates and uh, whether it could be uh, a Bank of England committee where you do a, a consensus, if you like. This consensus uh, or a team of, of, of experts, what is the consensus? And uh, we know beware, beware experts, think about uh, the subprime crisis who had never perhaps seen a fall in, uh, in house prices. But the idea of, of getting kind of a consensus view is quite a useful thing to gauge, uh, gauge current sentiment, gauge current opinion. Having your own judgments, so it's your, it's your business, it's your analysis, it's your own personal view as well. Um, and kind of mixing this in as well, having your own view on, on this. Yeah, the analyst here must adjust, must adjust these expectations based upon your own, your own insight. Remember, no one sees the world, the world the same way. By the way, before we, uh, we leave this, remember that there are plenty of um, biases. And uh, I had that model last time round for those uh, six psychological biases. Have a think for a moment what they are. When you think about the overconfidence, think about the, um, an the anchoring bias as well, the prudence, the status quo, the availability and the confirming evidence bias too. So the, uh, those uh, biases in the analyst forecast, got to watch out for those as well too. 
So here we go, they mentioned the famous uh, shrinkage estimate, which is a fancy way of saying have two forecasts. You use two sources of data. One, yeah, one might be the historical data, uh, guys coming here, um, and the, un the other here, number two, is, is your estimate. Um, and that could be from perhaps a model. So the idea of a shrinkage here, having two heads better than one, two forecasts better than one, the idea of, uh, of having a weighted average, average forecast. Now one of the ideas, often when you have these weighted averages here, you often have perhaps a long-term historical, you often have this long-term historical idea, and then very recent, the idea of very recent or short-term has been something different. Um, and so that idea is not an, not an unusual idea. So we have some formal tools coming in and we're headed towards one or two of, of our models coming in here. Um, and uh, they, they mentioned, guys, two models to start us off, the Gordon's growth from, from level two, and then the new one here at level three, our Gunnar and Kroner model as well too. Um, and uh, we have other ones too. We have uh, number three coming in, the Singer and Terha model coming in uh, in a moment as well too. Let's have a look at these. So firstly, with the uh, discounted cash flow approach, let's have a look at, uh, at this one here. Now, when you look at the, I guess, the yield to maturity of a bond, uh, we know that there are, there are impacts that can change this, of course, too. So changes, guys, in yield, change the in, in interest rates, uh, up, or, up or down. And uh, one of the, the links here uh, is to fixed income. I want to make a link to fixed income and the idea of Macaulay duration coming in here. And uh, we have two risks here. Number one, we have price risk. And number two, we have reinvestment risk. Price risk, we know, is of a yield rise. As price risk of a yield rise, we have a bond price fall. And a reinvestment risk of a yield fall, then the reinvestment vested income falls as well. But they make a point that's not really made on this slide too clearly, which is the idea is if you if you match guys here, if you match, yeah, your um, your Macaulay duration, your Macaulay duration, guys, to, to your maturity, your intended maturity, if you match these here, um, then you are immunized, guys, you're immunized against changes in yield. And what that means here, I'm going to mention this term immunization here. Going to see a lot more of this in the fixed income chapter, but if you match the the Macaulay duration to your uh, your time period, as your time horizon here, your time horizon. If you match those, then any impact of a change in price is offset against the change in the reinvestment rates as well. Um, and um, just to remind you from uh, from other levels here that uh, the, the modified duration, modified duration, here's the Macaulay duration, um, divided by one plus the yield, one plus the yield per period. Um, so if you rearrange this, guys, here, the Macaulay duration here, it's gonna be the, the modified duration multiplied by one plus the yield. So that's all the, this part of the slide is saying here. It's just reminding you that if you choose to use the yield to maturity, it's unlikely to be what you actually get back in real life because yields are changing. If yields are changing, on the one hand, you could win on the price side or you could lose on the reinvestment side. And the only time when you'll actually get that yield to maturity is if the modified duration of your portfolio matches the maturity and we're going to use this a lot more in the idea of asset liability management particularly with pensions and fixed income so in our side here in the economic area here yes could be useful to use the yield but just bear in mind that uh, the yield is going to change o over time much perhaps more practical for the exam more testable for the exam as well is to take a, a risk-free rate and like the building blocker suggests Add on a premium for different risks. Um, 
you have uh, start, starting off guys here with a default free uh, risk uh, free rate. Then um, for holding a longer bond, we're going to attract a risk premium to kind of a term premium here. And then for taking some credit risk, a credit risk premium. And then for the liquidity, a lack of liquidity, guys, a liquidity premium as well, as well too. So the idea of separating out um, it by risk premiums. A few notes about each one here. So the idea of a short-term default risk-free rate, um, ideally matching the, your, your forecast horizon, uses the most liquid assets, whether it's a, a, a government, government bond, for example, here. Yeah, the government bond here coming in. Then comes the term premium here, um, and, and looking at the spot yield curve over time, looking at different maturities over time, giving some useful information here. But there are other drivers, uh, like, like unexpected inflation, it can change, or when you think about, um, about the economy and, and supply and demand changing too. So, for, for example, if, you, if you're going into a downturn, this is actually quite an interesting area. When you get into a downturn, of course, the demand for these uh, risk-free massively rises, and, and of course the price massively rises too. Um, but you don't really mind because you've switched away from risk, a kind of a flight to quality, to something risk-free, and that kind of uh, pushes the price up here. And that could, that, that could create even a negative returning asset. Um, in the... In the uh, in other texts, they often call this uh, valuable assets, often call these valuable in a crisis. Just a quick recap there, make sure everyone's okay with this. What we're saying here is that um, the, uh, yeah, this, this, this term premium here, um, giving you information in terms of the extra return f for taking on that, uh, that longer time horizon in this way, is going to be impacted a lot by by other areas, like for example, the, the economy. Now guys, the credit risk premium, the credit risk premium coming in as well. Um, and uh, things like, for example, guys, expected losses, probability of default, times our loss given default, times our exposure at default, giving us our expected level of losses c coming in here. In CFA uh, fixed income, they also use the term uh, credit loss, cr uh, credit loss, um, and that's just PD times LGD, just as a percentage, if you like, credit loss as well. So, so this idea of being, being rewarded for having, taking the credit risk coming, coming in here. And uh, yeah, this compensation, um, one of the things they talk about here is uh, investment grade goes versus high yield here. Now investment grade, if you're a, a AAA rated credit, very unlikely to default, so guys, they talk about here down, downgrade risk. Because you're compensated there for downgrade risk. But if it's more high yield and you're perhaps down here at a double B maybe, then it's more default risk. Yeah, default risk in this way. So this idea of, um, of compensating for the amount of credits risk that you're taking here. Finally, uh, a liquidity premium. I mean, we talked before about things like real estate or things also like private equity that are quite illiquid anyway. Um, they're a problem with appraisal data as well. But here in this approach here, certain bonds have greater liquidity in our chapter. So newly issued have, have more liquidity, especially if they're close to par or market rates. The larger issues have more liquidity as well. And this is well known, well known issuer too. Um, and if the credit quality is quite good, quite strong, better liquidity as well.